Welcome to CCBC TV's Arts Showcase, a series featuring performances from the campuses of the Community College of Baltimore County. I'm Monica Otal, Professor of Music and Concert Manager at CCBC. Today's Arts Showcase presents The Hedge Band, comprised of four of Maryland's preeminent Irish traditional musicians, Billy Comiskey, Laura Byrne, Donna Long, and Pat Egan. All perform, teach, and are recognized and respected in Maryland, nationally, and worldwide. This performance is supported by a generous grant from the Maryland State Arts Council. <laughs> Thanks very much. We're the Hedge Band. We actually, I don't know, got together, what was it, about 15, was it 15 years ago, about that? Something like that. Something like that. We, uh, we came, we all kind of came to Maryland because it's just, you know, beautiful here. We all love it. And we all love Irish music. This is what, I, this is actually what Irish music has sounded like for four, maybe even 500 years. It's, uh, it's a very interesting culture. You can actually uh, get a doctorate in Irish music now. And there's actually, there's a player from here named Elliot Grasso uh, that did just that. He's living up in, the, up in the Northwest now. And so that was two reels that we played there. Um, a reel is kind of like four, eight time. Are there any musicians in here? Music major? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is, so this is interesting, isn't it? It, it, Irish music kind of survived by 
uh, people listening to it and just going, oh, I love that. That's how it's kind of how it, how it happened. And you have to kind of have like around relative pitch to understand it and get a kick out of it. So reels would be 4-8 time. Uh, they date back to the O'Farrell collection, I believe, which is, what is that, like the 1700s? It was a piper, there was a, a piper named O'Farrell. And he was so into the music that he didn't, he was more into the music than himself. He, he never in the book put down um, his first name. So it's pretty interesting. Maybe we'll play a tune from, from the O'Farrell collection for you later. So now we're, we're so that's uh, what real sound like. We're gonna play two Irish jigs now, right? The well, first one's a slip jig, okay. which will be a 9-8, and the second one's a regular old jig, which will be 6-8. So yeah, and, both, and, both yeah. Those, and both of those and both of those time signatures have been popular um, in Ireland for, uh, in Irish music for hundreds of years. We decided to put these together because they're both, they have something to do with water and boats and stuff. So what's the name of the, <laughs> what's the name of the? The first one's a fisherman's lilt, and the second is out on the ocean. No.
when that mic uh, dipped down there, it reminded me of um, when I was a kid at home. We had a, the TV. We, we had just gotten a TV, and then this thing came out. You remember the, the dock? You know, when you heat up the little thing, he would pop down and drink some water, come back up again. You familiar with those things? And maybe I'm too old for that. <laughs> but anyway. He's from Ireland. When this thing uh, hit the ground, that was the first picture that came into my head. I'll just sing a song instead. <laughs> it's a song um, that was written by an Irishman by the name of Wally Page. It's called So Do I. It's about a fisherman who is uh, sitting out, looking out at the ocean, admiring on the west coast of Ireland, admiring the view. And while he's doing this, he's got um, thoughts running through his head of this girl running around in a muslin dress that is driving him nuts. And he's thinking of all the nice, cool places that he could go, nice little coves and little spots. Okay. This is the day the fisherman likes, so do I. When the hills fall down in their different shapes, see the curlew cry. The nightingale sings her best, will drink a pint in Hamilton's rest, and the girl I love wore a muslin dress. Fishermen dream of the sun in the west, so do I. So do I And now I can see Oh, the girl that I love dearly She's cast that loving spell on me This is the day the cuckoo likes so do I When the hills fall down in their different shapes See the swallows fly To a hidden beach where boats can go Mountain rivers overflow I hear screaming of the seagulls As of home day to go So do I So do I And now I can see Oh, the girl that I love dearly She's cast that loving spell on me Well, I cross the western ocean Till she has cast that loving spell on me. This is the day the fisherman likes, so do I. When the rain puts a shine on the chestnut spikes, hear the curlew cry. The nightingale, she sings her best. We'll drink a pint in Hamilton's rest And the girl I love wore a muslin dress Fisherman dream of the sun in the west So do I So do I So do I So do I Thank you. Um, so this is a um, traditional Irish flute, and it's um, 
the flute that was played during Mozart's time period, during the classical era, and um, it's different from the silver flute concert flute you see today in that it's um, it's a conical bore, so it's not cylindrical, and it's obviously made out of wood. This one's made out of African black wood, and um, it's got just a great warm tone, so I'm going to play a slow air for you. This is called the Wounded Hussar, um, and it's a beautiful old Irish air. So. Um. <laughs> So that O'Farrell and that O'Farrell collection uh, that I was telling you about earlier, there was a there was a group of there was a, a selection of harp harp tunes in that in that book, and they are associated. They're credited to a man by the name of Turlock Turlock O'Carroll, and he was he's always defined as a traveling musician, a, a blind harper. I guess I guess back in, in his time. The 1600s, early 1700s, yeah, and around that time. I'm not a, obviously not a historian, but I, but I know my stuff. <laughs> uh, so he was, uh, he he made his living going around the country, uh, writing writing these gorgeous tunes that were passed down. Uh, he just uh, the, he'd he'd play them, and it's just like this. You'd hear it, and you'd go, okay, I have to play that. And so the parp. The harp was the, the big instrument back in those days, and again, it was a diatonic. It was a diatonic instrument, kind of like the kind of like the transverse flute here, and and the uh, and the Irish accordion, as a matter of fact. We'll tell you more about that later. So this tune I, he wrote for uh, a man by the name uh, by the name of Loftus Jones. It's a real, it's a really uh, it's a lovely tune. Uh, we all we all learned it from a, a gentleman by the name of Bruce Foley, who was studying the bassoon. At uh, Colgate, Colgate University, am I saying that right up in New York? And uh, he decided to learn the bassoon because it was the most challenging instrument he could get his hands on. He was just—he was bursting with music, this guy. And um, everybody 
has, everybody in Irish music all over the world knows this tune now because Bruce Foley found it um, in the uh, uh, life and times of Turlock O'Carolan. And he flat picked it on a guitar. We were at a party down in Washington and he flat picked it um, in A. And, and, I, and I said, that's beautiful, but I, I, I can't, I couldn't play, I couldn't do the tune justice. He goes, so he says, well, why don't you, he says, here, I'll play it for you in G. So he just kind of transposed it. And we all just thought that was brilliant because he was a bassoon player and he's sitting there playing, he just picked things up and played them. So that was really great. It's kind of how the music evolves. Is that interesting? <laughs> if I, if I, my wife would usually be sitting in the back and if I ramble too much, she goes like this. <laughs> and the face gets more dry. So I get, to, so I, get to, I get to play the first little bit, right? Yeah. Which is kind of ironic, you know, playing a harp tune on the accordion. I think that's pretty funny. <laughs>
Thank you very much. That was beautiful. Um, I'd like to tell you a story now. Uh, the Irish are supposedly great for telling stories. And this is a true story about a, uh, a young man from, well, actually, he was born and grew up in Chicago. His name is uh, Patrick Begley. And he's known as Pat Begley. But uh, his dad um, was John, uh, John Begley. And when his, his father had a, had a building business in Chicago and uh, was building houses and working hard and got his son through university. Uh, but while his son was growing up, he used to tell him lots of stories about where he came from, which is an area of Ireland and down in the south, southwest coast of Ireland. Beautiful, rugged spot, just absolutely gorgeous part of the country. And um, he used to tell his son about the place and where he grew up, what it was like, about the mystique and about the leprechauns and the little people and the mists and the fog and the music and everything that he grew up with. And um, he told his son that, he said, Pat, he says, when you graduate from college, he says, we'll go to Ireland together. And his father hadn't been back for many years, and of course, Pat had never been. So he was just dying to see the place, and he was kind of filled with all this. His imagination was just bursting with ideas about what this place was like. So um, before he graduated, unfortunately, his dad passed. So he decided in honor of his dad that he would go to Ireland himself. And uh, kind of a daunting task, really, because he'd never been there, but he said he was going to go anyway. And so he flew out from Chicago and landed in Shannon, which is on the West Coast. And from Shannon, you go almost directly south down into Kerry, which you have to go through Limerick and kind of cut in through Cork a little bit. And it's a beautiful countryside, but he arrives in Shannon and he has a rental car, and he had never driven on the other side of the road, and roundabouts were a complete mystery. And uh, so he gets in the car, and he decides to start off. It's very early in the morning when you arrive in, so he's feeling kind of tired, but he decides he'd, he'd make a go for it. So he um, gets and he hits the first roundabout. He goes around that around five times before he figures out <laughs> the road to take towards going towards Ennis. And then he sees the road for Limerick, so he decides to head to Limerick. He gets to Limerick, there's another roundabout, and he's trying to figure that one out, and he's looking for the N24, which goes down towards Cork. And he sees the sign, but for some reason, he just can't get himself over to get off the thing. So he eventually takes another road, which brings him out of the country a little bit, and he's totally exhausted by this time because he's Apart from the flight and just the whole tension of trying to drive in the wrong side of the road and get around these roundabouts. So he sees a B&B, &B, bed and breakfast sign, so he decides maybe I'll get some sleep and uh, just continue on when I'm rested. I might be better for the drive. So he goes into the B&B &B and a uh, woman of the house says, you'll have a cup of tea. And she says, where are you going? And he says, I'm going down to Kerry. And she says, oh, that's beautiful, beautiful, and the weather is so good. And uh, so she said, after you have a cup of tea, you should go to bed, maybe sleep off for a while. So he goes to, goes to bed, can't sleep, so he gets up, goes for a walk around the place, has a look around, comes back, goes to bed again, falls sound asleep, and woke up at about 5 o'clock in the morning. And he looks out, and it's a kind of just at dawn, kind of gray color outside. There's not a sound in the house, but he's wide awake and he decides, well, the roads will be quiet. I'll just go and take my chance right now. It'd be nice and quiet for driving. So he gets into the car, gets himself back to the roundabout, sees the road for Cork, gets on it. And as he's starting to drive down more and more into the country and getting away from the cities, the roads start to get narrow, uh, the sharp bends, these stone walls and all this kind of stuff. And he's driving along, and suddenly he starts climbing up into the mountains. And as he gets up into the mountains, there's a bit of a mist. And he's driving along, and all of a sudden, the car starts to just lurk along and just stop and go and stop and go, and eventually it dies down. And he gets out, and there's this mist around. All he sees is a stone wall and some trees, and he doesn't know where he is and what he's going to do. So he's standing there, and he decides he'd open up the hood of the car and have a look in, but he doesn't know anything about cars, so he's just looking at it. 
And next thing, there's a five stone. It's the carburetor. So he looks around, and he doesn't see anything. And it, the voice goes again, it's the carburetor. And he looks around, and all he sees is this horse looking at him from, from behind the wall. <laughs> and next thing, the voice goes again, just take the cap off the distributor there. If you have a hanky, give it a bit of a wipe. It's probably got damp because you're driving around in this fog, and it's probably gotten a kind of damp. Try that and see if it'll work. So he does that, and he's really nervous now. He just can't see anybody. He's going, who's there? There's nothing, just... So he takes off the distributor cap, gives it a wipe with a hanky, puts it back on, gets in. Lo and behold, the car starts up. So he jumps into the car, closes down the trunk, jumps into the car, and he drives away like crazy, and his heart is beating like crazy, and he's wondering, what the hell was that all about? And he comes down this hill, and he comes into this little village, and he sees this bar, and the front door of the bar is open, so he pulls the car up, and he goes into the bar, and the barman is inside, and he's cleaning up some glasses. It's Sunday morning, and he's getting ready for the onslaught after first mass, so he's kind of... <laughs> He's, he's cleaning out a few glasses because, you know, he had a late one the night before, so he didn't get a chance to wash up. So he's cleaning a few glasses, and he turns around, and he sees Pat standing there, white as a ghost. And he says, geez, he said, we're not quite open yet. He says, I need a drink. Pat goes, I need a drink. And he says, are you okay? He says, you look very pale. Oh, he says, you wouldn't believe what's after happening. He says, just give me a brandy. So he gets a, a brandy, and he gives it to him. And he says, what happened to you? He says... I broke down back the road there. He says, the car stopped on me. And I, and I got out to have a look at it. And he says, I, didn't, I, I, I don't know anything about cars, but I was just having a look to see if I could, maybe it was a loose wire or something. And next thing a voice told me it was the carburetor. And, and I couldn't, I asked if there was anybody there. And I, nobody said anything, just, just a voice told me what to do. And the guy says, there was no one there, no one around. No, he says, what? Well, he says, all was there, he says, was this horse looking at me over the wall. Ah, he says, ah, oh, yeah, he says, it was, the white, it, was, it was that white horse. Yeah, how did you know it was a white horse? Oh, he says, there's a brown one in the other field that doesn't know anything about cars. <laughs> Dear. That was really deep. <laughs> The rest of his trip was uneventful, really. <laughs> right, we're going to do a song now. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a lively one. Uh, it's really, really sad, but it's, uh, I sing it in a very upbeat fashion, and that way you don't really notice how sad it is at the end. And it's about a, a farmer who has this beautiful daughter who um, the local landlord wants to marry. And, the, of course, uh, the farmer is delighted with this because she's marrying in, into money. But she's in love with a, with a sailor, and she doesn't want to, or a soldier, she doesn't want to marry him. In the village of Kincori, there's a maiden young and fair. Her eyes that shone like diamonds, she had long golden hair. Well, a gentleman came riding, he came to her father's gate. He came on a milk white stallion, he came at the stroke of eight. Step it out, Mary, my fine daughter. Step it out, Mary, if you can. Step it out, Mary, my fine daughter. Show your legs to the countryman. Show your legs to the countryman. I've come to court you, daughter Mary of the golden hair. Got wealth and I've got money, I got lands beyond compare. I'll buy her silks and satins and a gold ring for her hand. I'll build for her a mansion, she loves servants at command. Step it out, Mary, my fine daughter. Step it out, Mary, if you can. Step it out, Mary, my fine daughter. Show your legs to the countryman. Show your legs to the countryman. Okay. 
Thanks are I love a soldier, I pledge to him my hand. Don't want your wealth or money, I don't want your house or land. Mary's father spoke up sharply, I'll do as you are told. You'll marry come next Sunday and you'll wear a ring of gold. Step it up, Mary, my fine daughter. Step it up, Mary, if you can. Step it up, Mary, my fine daughter. Show your legs to the country land. Show your legs to the country land. In the village of Kincori, there's a deep stream running by. They found Mary drowned at midnight. She died with a soldier boy. In the cottage there is a music. You can hear her daddy say, Step it up, Mary, my fine daughter. Sunday is your wedding day. Step it up, Mary, my fine daughter. Step it up, Mary, if you can. Step it up, Mary, my fine daughter. Show your legs to the country man. Show your legs to the country man. Step it up, Mary, my fine daughter. Step it up, Mary, if you can. Step it up, Mary, my fine daughter. Show your legs to the country man. Show your legs to the country man. Show your legs to the country man. Thank you. Um, well, the piano is not a traditional Irish instrument. Um, it came into play around 19, around the early 1900s, and in the 1920s, it was used to back up big Cayley bands, which were dance bands. Um, and it really started here in America. And they loved it in Ireland, so they moved the, the recordings back to Ireland. So piano became more popular after the 20s. And in the 50s, it really took off and took more of a place in the music with both melody and uh, backing up the tunes. But Billy mentioned the harp player, Turlock O'Carolyn. And um, his music really, I, I love his music very much. And it survived, um, fortunately, through a festival that um, somebody actually wrote uh, all of his tunes down and kept track of them in a book. And um, just the melodies, no, uh, none of the chords or anything for the harp or anything like that. But I like to take the tunes and um, play them on the piano because the piano and the harp are so similar. So this tune is called the Bridget Cruise.
something. What's the first thing to call? Let's have another hand for Donna, because well, let's go. <laughs> There are, there are maybe two or three players, maybe, maybe, that were interpreting, I don't think, I'd say maybe one interpreting O'Callaghan's music on the piano like that before Donna started. And she's ridiculously popular and influential in Ireland. It's really amazing. Can you give her another round of applause? What, what, what is that play? What's that called? The, yeah. the accordion uh, and the concertina both were came into existence right around the turn of the 20th century. There, uh, the concertina has gotten very, very popular. It's considered a very old and very, very appropriate. Uh, the, and the accordion is kind of finding its way. It, 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 it was a diatonic instrument and originally had one, one, row, one diatonic scale. <laughs> So if you were down in Louisiana, they'd have a little accordion with little knobs up here with this one row. And that's, it was, it's, the, the, the keys existed just right there. So there'd be like a mix of. <laughs> if you ever heard Cajun music or, or uh, uh, up in Quebec. <laughs> so they'd only be playing all this beautiful music on one row. So somehow or another, this fellow named Paolo Soprani in uh, Castle Fidardo came up with this idea. If you take two diatonic keys a half a step apart, you kind of more or less have the whole circle of fifths. You can so it's, it's an interesting thing that happened that uh, uh, brought the accordion into Irish music. Uh, but there was a key figure, and this man's name was Joe Cooley, and he played this old style, the single row melodian style, but he played it on a two row accordion. And he, he was the bridge uh, that brought the Irish accordion into, into uh, existence in Irish music. And so some people say that's a good thing, and other people don't agree with that. <laughs> but he, uh, he, uh, he, he played and recorded these two tunes. And uh, we'll hear now how the piano would have been, I guess, around the 60s, right? So we're, well, I'll play these two tunes. Uh, the boys, the boys, is it the boys? What is it, the first boys one? The, lock. the Boys of the Lock and, and the Bucks of Armour. The Bucks of Armour is about as popular a tune as there is in Irish. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, we'll continue with another song here. This song is uh, relatively new, uh, and it's from Dungarvan down in County Waterford, right on, on the coast, a beautiful, beautiful part of the world. There's a beautiful little bay in there. It's just gorgeous little place. And it's a love song that traces uh, the life of this couple from when they were around nine up to the time of uh, their death, really. So it goes through their, their, their life together. And there's beautiful imagery in it, and beautiful, it's almost like poetry, but it's a, a gorgeous song. So I learned it from the si singing of a man from Galway by the name of Sean Terrell. And um, I put a different melody to it, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Oh, when I was nine, at harvest time, I crossed the orchard wall. Oh, the moon was bright and the apples ripe, upon the ground did fall. We filled our sacks, then we made some tracks, more adventures soon to find in an orchard. Need the comrades by my sweet Dungarvan Oh, when I was scarcely ten years old I crossed that wall again It was, I think, to be my first drink Of cider and butchie I remember well, it tasted like hell, and I hoped that the pain would ensue in an orchard. Meet the comrades of my sweet Dungarvan home. Oh, when I was scarcely sixteen years, I crossed that wall with pride. My Annie fair with nut brown hair, she was walking by my side. We tumbled, we tossed, till our clothes came off. All innocence, it was gone in an orchard. Need the comrades of my sweet Dungarvan sea. Oh, when I was twenty-one years old, I married Annie there. The apple blossoms on the trees look better in her hair. And when the day was over and done, there was a drunk for every tree in an orchard need the comrades of my sweet and garvin Now we're 35, we're much alive, and children we've got four. Three girls and one fine strapping son, and we've got hopes for more. Teach them about life and what lies ahead. And they got plenty more in store in an orchard. Need the comrades of my sweet Dungarvan.
21, my day is near done. Annie, she's long since gone. Our days were good and well they should, but it's time that I moved on. And when I die, sure I want to lie beneath the whispering trees in an orchard beneath the compass of my sweet unbothered. Thank you. up here with a set of reels. It's been great playing for you today. Um, and uh, these are some reels that were composed by a flute player when he, um, the second one was written when he came to visit Baltimore. There's a Baltimore in Ireland, and this one he wrote for his visit here. It's called The Salute to Baltimore by Josie McDermott. You're a great audience, you guys. Thank you. 